so welcome today to our um, our next TPD webinar. Uh, today we will be hearing a great talk from Gabe Lander. Uh, Gabe is a professor in the Department of Structural and Computational Biology at Scripps Research, um, where his group um, focuses on um, combining cryo-EM methodologies with biochemical, biophysical, and computational techniques. Um, and today we will be hearing about how he's been moving and gluing proteins um, using cryo-EM to see molecular glues in action. Um, so with that, Gabe, I will hand it off to you. Thank you very much, Brianna. Um, and I want to thank uh, all the organizers. I guess, Brianna, Mikolai Rod Rodick, uh, Ho Jong, and I guess Catherine, who's not with us yet, uh, for for inviting me to to give a, uh, one of these talks. This is really a, a high end set of webinar, like the webinar series that you've put together, and it's a, somewhat intimidating to be giving a talk here, knowing the the caliber of researchers that have given talks in this in this series previously. Um, and I have to say, I'm, I'm a relative newcomer to the, the targeted degradation field. So it is really a, a privilege and an honor to be asked to give this seminar. Um, as, as Brianna mentioned, my background is more uh, cryo-electron microscopy methods development. And um, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna talk about today is using cryo-electron microscopy to kind of gain new insights into mechanisms of proteins that presumably had been pretty established and what cryoEM can bring to the field and the intersection of cryoelectron microscopy and crystallography and uh, uh, other biophysical methods. Uh, so nowadays, when you hear about cryoelectron microscopy, the kind of images that come to mind are you know, these very, at least what you hope for, are these very high resolution structures where uh, you can start to see uh, the side chains and oftentimes uh, slightly even better resolution. Um, but that's always the hope. And there are developments that have happened in the field in the past few years that have really pushed the ability to resolve structures to the point where we are actually near atomic resolution. Near atomic is a phrase that gets tossed around quite a bit. And I'm not always supportive of the use of the term uh, near atomic, but in these kinds of cases where you're at better than two maximum resolution, you are um, really approaching near atomic. And you can buy very, very expensive microscopes to solve structures like this. But the caveat is that the structures have to be very, very stable, pretty much completely inflexible. And so if you want to get a structure at this kind of resolution, I'll tell you how to do it. Buy the most expensive microscope that you can, $10 million, and put a very boring sample like apoferritin into the microscope. And then you can resolve structures that border on what has already been established and done by crystallographers for many, many years. So what we're really interested in my group is using the cryoelectron microscopy approach not to uh, get to better than two maximum resolution. It's always nice if you can push the resolution, but more use this methodology to investigate the large swath of conformationally variable structures that exist inside the cell and how all these structures and these complexes interact with one another to carry out, carry out biological systems. Uh, so I said I was a newcomer to the field of targeted protein degradation, and that's not, I guess, entirely true because as a postdoc at, uh, at UC Berkeley, when I was with Eva Nogales, we collaborated extensively with uh, Andreas Martin's lab at, uh, at, at UC Berkeley. And we studied the 26S proteasome together. And the 26S proteasome together, uh, as you know, is this massive multi-subunit complex, multi-enzyme complex that carries out all the protein degradation that you guys are very, very interested uh, in studying and targeting. So it's, it's targeting proteins to the 26S proteasome via ubiquitin. And, Back in 2013, this is what we considered to be high resolution cryoelectron microscopy. You would collect data for weeks sometimes to get enough images uh, to be able to process the data for then another set of weeks or maybe months to be able to get maybe an eight angstrom resolution structure. But these eight angstrom structures were 
sufficient to begin to understand the conformational rearrangements that are associated with biological function. And this is what really drew me to cryo-EM is its ability to explore conformational variability uh, and distinct states and how those states might relate to mechanism. So this is work that we did um, with Mary Matiskela and Andy's group uh, in 2013, where we showed that the 26S proteasome undergoes this massive reorganization uh, when it binds to a ubiquitinated substrate and then explored all the different uh, rearrangements that have to occur for uh, subsequent translocation, deubiquitination. And this is a collaboration that we continued for several years um, into 2018 uh, with a postdoc in my group, uh, Andres Hernandez de la Peña, who solved this structure uh, in collaboration with Andy in 2018. And this was obviously much higher resolution. Now we were in into the resolution resolution of cryo and we could see how the ubiquitinated substrate was threaded down through the motors of the 26S proteasome uh, with the gate of the 20S uh, open for the substrate to make its way through, and also how the ubiquitin was positioned relative um, to the deubiquitinase for deubiquitination. Uh, so what we've spent a lot of time in the group working on is not necessarily the, the targeted protein degradation, but we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how these proteins, once they're engaged by these ATPase motors, are then unfolded and then translocated towards a proteolytic core for degradation. But I have to say, we've always been interested in this, this linkage here, this isopeptide linkage between ubiquitinated substrates um, and the, you know, the peptide of the substrate. And uh, this is, I guess, where, we're, where we enter into the targeted protein degradation field. So I know that everyone who's in attendance today is more of an expert in this field than I am, but um, because this is going on YouTube and there may be people who are not familiar with all the steps of you know, the E3 ligase system, uh, I'm just gonna give you a very, very brief overview, a very simplified overview of what is going on. Uh, so if you're already an expert in this, you can tune out for a few minutes, but obviously we have ubiquitin, which is ubiquitous in the cells, and it's the target, it's the marker for um, proteins to get targeted to the 26S proteasome, among other, other things. So these um, ubiquitin pro uh, proteins are engaged by an activating E1 enzyme. The E1 enzyme then transfers the ubiquitin to a conjugating enzyme, which is referred to as an E2. And then it docks onto a platform uh, that's involved, um, well, a, a platform that has, I, mean, it's, I guess it's a scaffold you could refer to it as. And, and on that, you have a platform made by the uh, ring box protein and the E3 ligase. And so the, the E2 enzyme along with the ubiquitin brings it over to that platform. And then you want to transfer this ubiquitin to the protein, the targeted protein for degradation. And this, these scaffolding platforms don't necessarily directly transfer the ubiquitin to the targeted protein immediately. There are adapter proteins that are involved, and this enables a single scaffold to increase its versatility of the types of proteins that it's able to, to ubiquitinate. It also adds a level of specificity to the entire system. So one of these adapter proteins, and it's a protein that we're going to be talking a lot about today, is DDB1. It's an adapter protein, and it has a WD40 domain that attaches to the base of this scaffold. And we'll uh, dissect this a little bit further here. This is damage-specific DNA binding protein 1, DDB1. I attended a, uh, a DNA repair meeting last week and learned that yeah, DDB1 is involved in more than just uh, the... the the, the details of the specific system that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, it has a lot of roles in DNA repair, uh, but it's made up of three beta propellers, A, B, and C. You might hear me refer to them as BPA, BPB, and BPC during this talk. And if we turn it on its head, uh, we can see that uh, if we make a molecular surface and color it by hydrophobicity, we can see that it has this deep binding groove, a very hydrophobic groove. 
And one would expect that substrates, targeted substrates could then, um, that maybe there are hydrophobic patches that would bind into this groove. And indeed there are some substrates that do directly bind to this group of the adapter protein. But for the most part, this groove serves as a binding pocket for a slew of DDB1 and Kulthor associated factors, otherwise known as DCAFs. And each one of these adapter proteins have a hydrophobic appendage. It's usually a, a loop or maybe a helix or a set of helix, helices that dock into this binding pocket. And this now establishes the full adapter complex that can then finally bind the, the substrate that's going to be targeted or that's going to be ubiquitinated, the targeted substrate for ubiquitination. So putting it all together, I know that you've seen this all before many times as interacting ovals and circles, but to give you a sense of what is really happening here, this is my attempt to, to show you the full complex as, um, as it stands for ubiquitination of a targeted protein. And obviously this field is very, very interested in understanding the detailed interactions that are occurring between substrates as they're positioned for ubiquitination here. Because if we can understand the intricacies, the molecular intricacies of substrate interaction with any of these adapter proteins, it gives us incredible power and flexibility over targeting different types of proteins for subsequent degradation. Um, and then just continuing in my uh, introduction here, even though it, it's probably very, very established and everyone here in this group already knows about it, um, the field has taken advantage of this adapter ubiquitination system uh, and developed a slew of, of small molecules that can function to mediate interactions between adapter proteins and targeted proteins for, for degradation and ubiquitination and degradation. And they break up into two categories. There are proteolysis targeting chimeras, protax, and there's a lot of these because you just need a moiety. Uh, these are heterobifunctional linkers where one part binds to the decaf and another will bind to a particular region on your target. Uh, and then, and there's usually a flexible linker in between. Uh, and there's a lot of these, obviously, it's over 2000 that have been publicly disclosed. This slide was made a while ago, so there may be more than this now. Um, and then there are also molecular glues, and these are thought to uh, be involved in binding more of the what are termed undruggable targets. Um, and we'll get into more into what undruggable really means in a little bit. But these molecular glues, they're often found or determined by serendipity uh, because they just happen to generate a binding surface on the on the on the decaf that promotes binding of, of target substrates. So we're gonna be talking about most of molecular glues today. And this is just the obligatory list of degraders uh, that are in uh, and approaching the clinic, uh, making lots of companies, lots and lots of money. And you can see that there, the number of Protax far outnumber the number of molecular glue degraders that are uh, in or approaching the clinic. So now let's talk about one of these molecular glues. This is thalidomide. It's been discussed extensively in this webinar series. I'm not going to go into the history. A quick Google search will tell you all about the horrible things that happened with thalidomide. But what, was, what is important is that in the early 2000s, it was approved by the FDA for treatment of a variety of cancers, including multiple myeloma. And it was discovered in 2010 that this thalidomide uh, ligand bound specifically to this CRBN, one of these decaf proteins that I mentioned earlier. This is Cerablon, and it's going to be kind of the star of today's talk, and it's been the star of many prior talks in the series. <clears throat> Later work uh, from Eric Fisher and Nico Thomas group and um, a rising star at Celgene at the time, Philip Chamberlain, uh, solved the crystal structures of uh, the DDB1 cerebellon co-complex with uh, the these with thalidomide or one of these analogs um, bound in this binding pocket. So it gave us 
a sense of how these ligands are interacting with the cerebellum protein. And it uh, shows how the scleteromid ring of the of uh, all these different analogs interacts with a tri-trip, tri, uh, three trip defends, a tri-trip pocket uh, in the uh, in the cerebrum, cerebellum protein. And then things got really exciting when folks realized what was being targeted by the, the thalidomide bound cerebellum protein, because it turns out it's not a native substrate that was being targeted. It was a, a transcription factors. And these transcription factors are not normally targeted by cerebellum. So this was what kind of gave a lot of impetus for research into this field, because this drug was binding to cerebellum and endowing targeting of non-native substrates, neo-substrates is what they're referred to as. And these substrates, Icaros and Aelios, Aeolos, uh, were transcription factors, which are thought of as undruggable targets. And why are they undruggable? Because they, when you target a protein for, for you know, targeted drug design, you want to have a very complex surface oftentimes with deep binding pockets, uh, things that are very large that you can attach uh, small molecules to. And transcription factors, for the most part, they're very messy, they're flexible, they have very broad surfaces, they make interactions that are very facial, kind of face-on-face -face interactions. So it's very difficult to develop drugs that will robustly and tightly bind into specific binding pockets on transcription factors. So the realization that you, these drugs were, were creating a surface on cerebellum that would then target transcription factors for degradation uh, was very, very exciting and many, many people uh, started working in this field at that point. And there have been many, many ligands that have been de uh, designed and that target this cerebellum protein. This is just a small gallery. Uh, there, are, there are quite a few more. And these different drugs endow different specificities to the, to the cerebellum system so that you can target different proteins for degradation. And by targeting different types of proteins, you can use that uh, to leverage uh, treatments for different types of diseases. So how did I get involved in this, in the, in the molecular glue field? So this uh, started in 2015 when a um, former fellow postdoc at Berkeley, uh, Mary Matuskela joined the team at Celgene and uh, we established a collaboration along with Phil Chamberlain at Celgene to study and use cryo-electron microscopy to study the interaction between cerebellum DDB1 and uh, this, uh, this protein that they were targeting for degradation, GSPT1. And it was being medi mediated by this drug, CC885. And they found that it, um, it had a decent effect in treating myeloid, myeloid uh, leukemia cell lines. And so we wanted to use electron microscopy to, for the first time, start studying the interactions between the drug Cerebron and GSPT1. This is 2015. People are getting very excited about the resolution revolution in cryo-EM. And we were going to start solving high-resolution structures of DDB1 Cerebron bound to these different substrates. So I remember the very first day we were on the microscope. Uh, Mary and Phil were there and we were on this very tiny screening microscope looking at negative stain. And it was really exciting when we saw these beautiful little complexes on the negative stain grid. And by doing some two-dimensional analyses, we were able to very clearly uh, localize the different domains of the protein. So up on the top, you see cerebellum DDB1 with ligand. And you can, this is one of the class averages. You can see the correlation between what we were seeing in the negative stain and the crystal crystallography that had previously been done. And then excitingly, when we added uh, ligand and substrate to the system, we were able to see GSPT1 bound to cerebellum. And because the GST had a GST, sorry, the GSPT1 had a GST tag, uh, we were able to see the tag as well. And as I mentioned before, with electron microscopy, you, you are not limited to one single structure. You can assess conformational variability with electron microscopy. And even with negative stain, we were able to see the extent of mobility that was present in the, the cerebellum one ligand GSPT1 complex. So this is just a movie of all the different conformations that we were able to see. You can see the GSPT1 
at least the GST most prominently flopping around at the end here. So it was great. I was excited we were doing negative stain. Um, but of course, Mary and Phil were determined to get a structure as fast as they could. And they were working furiously to get a crystal structure and through a really heroic effort on the part of uh, Mary and cheerleaded by, by Phil, they were able to get a crystal structure of this way before we were able to do any more cryo-electron microscopy. So they, they scooped us um, internally with, with a crystal structure. But the stru crystal structure showed the interaction between the CC885 ligand and GSPT1, and importantly showed how it interacts with this beta hairpin. Uh, and what was what's notable about this interaction here is that uh, it, it, this glycine, and I guess this became more obvious when, as others, other groups solve structures of substrates bound to uh, cerebron with the ligand present, uh, this, this seems to be a conserved structural degron, for lack of a better word, where it doesn't really matter what sequence you have in this beta hairpin, as long as you have this glycine positioned right here relative to the ligand and cerebron, uh, you will have a pretty robust, uh, robust in, or sufficiently robust interaction for degradation. And there have been several companies that have uh, spun off of this idea, this idea that you have uh, this conserved structural degron and by maybe learning more about these interactions and manipulating them or, or um, I guess leveraging the knowledge of these interactions, you can expand the, the, um, the, the types of proteins you can target for degradation. So that was very exciting that they now they have a crystal structure. They know now how these molecular glues or get a better sense of how these molecular glues are working. But as a structural biologist interested in cryo EM, I was spending a lot of time ruminating on these 2D averages that we were getting from the cerebellum DDB1 um, in the absence of substrate that we collected. And some of these class averages, as I mentioned before, match very nicely with the crystal structures that have been previously determined. But a lot of these class averages were just not making sense to me. And we had a lot of discussions with Phil and Mary about what this could possibly mean. Uh, because as you can see here, in the negative stain averages, the TDB1 looks very similar. But the, the top portion, the cerebron, looked like it was not this one single domain or stable globular domain, as was seen over and over again in the crystallography. It looked like it was separating. So let's talk a little bit about the cerebron protein and talk about its structure. It's broken up into three domains. There's the aptly named thalidomide binding domain, the, the domain that binds thalidomide. There is a helical bundle. This is the region that docks into the DDB1 uh, hydrophobic pocket. And then there's this lawn-like domain. It's, it, it's found in the lawn protease, but this lawn domain here has no proteolytic activity. It's just structurally conserved. Um, and as I mentioned, this, this docks onto the DDB1 complex. And as you can see here in the negative stain, uh, these two, the, it appears as though the thalidomide binding domain and the lawn domain in the negative stain are separated. They're not tightly bound to one another as they are, and as they had been seen in all the crystal structures up until this point. Then in 2018, something exciting and puzzling <laughs> happened. Uh, two groups solved the structure uh, of uh, DDB1 cerebron bound to substrate, and the domains were separated from one another. And these crystal structures more closely matched what we were seeing in the negative stain. So this gave us some confidence that this, this confirmation here, where the two domains are separated, likely exists. Uh, this is not some artifact of negative stain. We use low pH for negative stain. And there was our, I mean, some conversation about maybe pH is causing this. Uh, we had to use polylysine to get over preferred orientation with negative stain. Maybe that was causing this open form. But now crystallography had also seen these open form conformers. One minor concern with this was that these, these as you know, in crystallography, you have to crystallize your protein. And the substrate and lawn and thalidomide domains uh, were involved in 
interprotein crystal contacts that were involved in generating these crystals. So there was some skepticism within the community about the physiological relevance of this open confirmation. These are just some quotes from, from the papers. Um, so these two domains have been observed apart and we now you know, want to know what is the physiological relevance? Is this open confirmation real? Is it really just a, an artifact of just doing different, using different structural biology approaches to understand this? But if these are real, what is the role of this open to close transitions? And is this somehow related to the mechanism that's associated with uh, the molecular glues uh, that are and, and protein targeting? So, so we decided along with Celgene to hire a postdoc. And thankfully for us, a very talented postdoc came along. Uh, this is Randy Watson, who had done his PhD and some postdoc doctoral work with Brenda Schulman. Uh, it was at St. Jude's and then moved with her to the Max Planck. And thankfully we were able to recruit him back to, 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 to the States to carry out this postdoctoral work in collaboration with Celgene. And all the work that I'm gonna show you today was not using very high-end uh, electron microscopes, what we were using are these 200 keV, I guess, lower end microscopes. Many institutes around the world use them for screening. Uh, we've collected data on Krios and on the Arctica, these lower end scopes, and we really don't see any notable difference in the quality of the reconstructions that come out from these two different structures, uh, different microscopes. So one of these lower end microscopes is more than sufficient to, to carry out all this work. I just feel very obliged to, to say to say that because you don't need a cryos to do high resolution electron microscopy. Thermo Fisher cringes every time I say that. Um, but anyway, we, we were very excited when Randy started and even more excited when he put the first sample into the grid, DDB with Cerebron, and we saw these beautiful images of very monodispersed, highly concentrated complexes in the electron microscopy. And uh, this is our first attempt to solve the structure of the APO, Cerebron DDB1, to see if we have this open state confirmer. And we got a very high resolution structure. We were very excited. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's not what we wanted. This is a crystallography construct that we were using that lacks the, the beta propeller B, this bottommost beta propeller that in, is involved in binding to the, the Collins scaffold. Uh, which is fine. We were expecting that. What we were not expecting is to see absolutely no trace of cerebron bound where it's supposed to be in that hydrophobic pocket. Uh, so it was a high resolution structure, but it was really useless to us because we couldn't infer any kind of detailed information about physiological relevance of open and closed cerebron from this structure. And so why does something like this happen? Um, and so I just have to spend a, a minute talking about what's going on in electron microscopy when we prepare samples. So anyone who's done electron microscopy uh, has, is assuming that their particles are nicely and evenly distributed in the center of vitrified ice. And they're you know, in this near native state where they're just happily in solution and buffer and they've been flash frozen and we're getting a good representation of what they might look like inside the cell, or at least in solution. But unfortunately, we do very, very horrible things to our proteins when we freeze them for electron microscopy. We pound them during this process thousands of times against the very hydrophobic surface of the air-water interface. And unless you have a very, very robust, stable protein complex, these repeated interaction with a hydrophobic surface will cause the protein to partially denature, it can sometimes disassemble. And particularly if you have a hydrophobic interaction, that hydrophobic interaction can get wedged apart. And because DDB1 and Cerebron is like, largely dictated by hydrophobic interactions, this is likely what's happening is you get either partial denaturation of the hydrophobic regions at the air-water interface, or just you know, they, they, they dissociate from one another. Uh, so we had to overcome this. And this most, most uh, cryo-M projects get stuck here with interactions at the air-water interface. And so we, uh, no, we, I say we, Randy uh, launched on this uh, goal of trying to, to get Cerebron DDB1 to behave 
in vitreous ice. And we have lots of tricks that we can try. We can add detergents. We can add thin layers of graphene, thin layers of graphene oxide, carbon. The problem is this is such a small sample. The whole thing together is around 150, um, 200 kilodaltons, depending on the substrate that you're targeting. Uh, we, we are very limited in the types of substrates we can use in the background to, to protect the particles from the air-water interface. And it took Randy, along with the help of uh, Andres, uh, Andres de la Peña, who was here, a postdoc at the, or actually who was at BMS at the time, before he went on to Neomorph. Um, they spent over a year optimizing cryobium sample prep. Uh, and I don't know how many grids Randy actually looked at, but he was able to figure out the important the very important way to, to preserve the sample. And I'm able to finally go over in detail what Randy is doing to overcome this, this, this issue, because I know that there are lots of groups around the country and, and probably the world who are trying to study DDB1 cerebron using cryoelectric microscopy. So this is how you, this is how you do it. Um, something that I think is important is use manual plunging in the cold room. If you have questions about that, please email me offline. Uh, it, 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 very easy to find if, with a Google search. Uh, but what we we just set up a manual plunging system in the cold room that enables us to freeze grids much faster than one could with the VitroBot or any of the of the other plunge based devices that one can buy. Um, we use gold grids to get very very thin ice, and we load them on the tweezers. And what we do is first treat the grids with a mutant Icaros construct. This is residues 140 to 196 from Icaros. It carries two mutations in zinc finger two, and this should not bind. It's been shown by BMS, and I believe others that this mutation, these mutations to, uh, to Icaros do, does not interact with Cerebron. So it's Cerebron agnostic. It's been used as a control show that uh, certain zinc fingers do not bind and interact with cerebellum. So we first take 10 micromolar, uh, four microliters of a 10 micromolar solution and add this to the gold grid. And we, what Randy does is wick away the sample from behind. So it wicks onto the filter paper. And then very quickly, what we're left with is a small, a small layer of this, this mutant Icaros in solution on the grid. And very rapidly then, Randy applies the Cerebron DDB1 sample that we're interested in. And that's at five, five mg per mil. Um, and then we blot from the normal side. So the back blotting is not the side where we, where we wick through. That's not the normal side that we, we blot from when we're preparing samples for cryo uh, EM. We, we blot from the front. And when we do this, we are able to finally preserve the DDB1 Cerebron complex. And for the first time now, this is showing you that we can see the Cerebron tightly bound to the DDB1 um, protein down below. So now for the first time, we're able to solve the structure of the kind of resting state of Cerebron DDB1. And Randy was able to get a nice reconstruction of Cerebron DDB1. And you can see that 100% of the cerebron is in this open state where the T, the, the thalidomide binding domain and the lawn domain are completely separated. We saw no indication that there was uh, closure of these two domains. Uh, so the question then was maybe this is because we're missing the BPB and this is somehow there's some allosteria associated with the BPB. This is a crystal, con a crystal construct, same type of construct that was used for the crystal structures that had the open form. Let's look at the, the the, the, the DDB1 complex that has all three domains. And Randy did that and confirmed that no lack of the BPB does not impact the Cerebron conformation. We still see 100% open. So now, okay, we're getting somewhere. So the next question is, do cell mods, these small molecules, do they promote this open to closed transition? So Randy, first experiment was to add pomalidomide. And he added it in great excess. And if it binds, we know the pomalidomide binds very tightly to the, the thalidomide binding pocket. And so they should all be completely saturated with pomalidomide. And it would be super cool if we saw that just adding pomalidomide trend forces everything to close up. But that's not what we saw. Um, we saw that only 20% of the particles closed. So there's still something else to this. Um, one could say, surmise that maybe 
the it's just the closed form that has pomalidomide bound to it. But what happens if we turn this around and look at the, the thalidomide binding pocket of the open conformation, we see very clearly it's not low, it's not high resolution reconstruction, but it's sufficient to very clearly um, see that we have density corresponding to pomalidomide in the binding pocket. So 100% of our particles are bound to pomalidomide in this complex, but only 20% are actually closing. So this is a very important finding because it, 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 what it means is that binding to the thalidomide binding pocket alone does not necessarily mean you're gonna be able to get closure. And if that closure is important for substrate binding, uh, you need there has to be something else, some other mechanistic um, interaction that, that dictates that. So we have 100% binding of pomalidomide, but only 20% closure. So let's talk about the, the interactions between the, the pomalidomide uh, and the cerebron. And what we see is that there is this beta hairpin, which we refer to as the sensor loop, that makes extensive interactions with a drug, any drug that's binding in that thalidomide binding pocket. And this uh, has been seen over and over again, uh, even in structures where you don't have the long domain and just you know, the thalidomide uh, domain bound to ligand will have this sensor loop uh, up in, a, in, this, in this position where it makes extensive interactions with the ligand. And our cryo-EM was very consistent. We have very got pretty nice density for the, the sensor loop here. Uh, you can see that the crystal structures match very nicely with the cryo-EM. So what does the sensor loop look like in this open conformation? Could there be a clue here? So if we look at the thalidomide binding domain in this APO form, we do not see any density that corresponds to the sensor loop where it would be if um, if ligand was bound. So this is this is again the APO form. There's no ligand here. This is the open conformation. When we look around this region, what we see is that we have density, low resolution density, that likely, very likely corresponds to this sensor loop. And what we think is happening is this loop is in an alternate conformer where it's reaching down, interacting with maybe regions of the helical bundle domain of cerebron, as well as some of the more flexible loops of DDB1. So it's this interaction of maybe a tight interaction, but altogether it's an interaction of flexible loops that are kind of moving around. And this is why we're not able to resolve it to higher resolution. And it could be these interactions that are maintaining the resting state, the APO form of cerebron in this open conformation. It may be a regulatory uh, system that's involved in, in uh, protein targeting for degradation or for ubiquitination. Uh, and what we see is that when we add palmolidamide, there are many particles, uh, presumably 80% of the particles, where even though we have palmolidamide bound, we still have this loop in this down position. And it's only 20% of those particles where the sensor loop has been able to detach from this lower region and make interactions with, um, with the ligand. Uh, we confirmed this with HDXMS. This is just the open and closed conformers showing you the differential between the APO uh, plus ligand. So we were able to confirm that with an orthogonal approach that addition of ligand does promote closure and we have a switch from open to close. So the real question that we're trying to get to is, well, what does this mean? Does, does the open and close have anything to do with substrate binding? If, if all it takes is ligand binding, whether it's open or closed and you still get substrate, uh, then it doesn't, we're just wasting our time. We're, I mean, it's, it's very interesting, but uh, it physiologically doesn't make much, much, it doesn't have much impact. And the crystallography, uh, crystallography, Crystallographic structures already show that substrate does seem to bind to the open conformer. So we took different constructs of Icaros. This is an alpha fold model of the, the, of the full length Icaros. And it's, it's just, as a structural biologist, it's horrifying to me that so much of biology is dictated by what seem to be just tangles of messy protein. It's just, it's astonishing to me that we don't all you know, we're not riddled with cancer in every single cell um, of our body. But um, it's been shown that you can take different zinc fingers, and this is work by Nico Tomas' group, showing that different zinc fingers can bind directly to the cerebellum 
uh, domain and they have different affinities. And the, what seems to be the most important uh, zinc finger, zinc finger two right here. So we took zinc finger two and just added that on its own to the serapon D3-1 complex in the presence of pomalidomide. And we did not really see any density. We, if we lower the threshold, you can maybe see a little bit of density for, um, for uh, the zinc finger two, but it was not very strong and we were not very confident in it. But then when we started, this is where it would be binding, showing you that we have no density for the zinc finger. But any of the other constructs, whether we have zinc fingers one, two, three, zinc fingers one and two, or zinc fingers two and three, we see robust interaction with only the closed form. The open conformers of cerebron in the presence of pomalidomide do not have any binding for the substrate. So it does seem to us, and we have very strong evidence for this based on the cryo-EM, that the closure of these two domains is absolutely critical for interaction with substrate. So we're starting to get a, a better sense of how this whole system is working. Uh, here is the open conformation of Cerebron. You can see that the in magenta is the sensor loop uh, and it's interacting with the helical bundle and DDB1. And this is presumed to be the resting state of, of Cerebron DDB1. When you have a drug that binds, then you have this rearrangement. This can trigger a rearrangement through interactions with the sensor loop that then releases the sensor loop from its interactions with lower domains. And then once this happens, it seems to close immediately. We, we've, Randy has collected millions and millions of particles and processed these extensively with very, very thorough 3D classification, 2D classification. And even in the 2Ds, you never see an intermediate between the open and closed. It seems to us that when this sensor loop is attached from DDB1 HBD, regions, it snaps shut it like a, like a clamshell. It, there, there's no intermediate. It must be a very, very fast interaction. Uh, and uh, this is, is particularly important because it's this closure that then enables binding to the substrate. We've also noticed that uh, closure triggers a rearrangement of the N-terminal uh, disorder polypeptide of the long domain. There are 64 residues in this region of the long domain. And when you have closure, 15 of those amino acids seem to assemble into a helix or pseudo helix uh, that forms a very nice stable, what Randy refers to as a safety belt that wraps around the thalidomide binding domain, stabilizing this closed conformer. Uh, and we've shown uh, along with BMS that if you, do, if you truncate this, this region of, of, the, uh, of the long domain, you get uh, reduced uh, Icarus ubiquitination. And we've also shown using cryoelectric microscopy that if you remove this region of the, of the lawn domain, uh, the N-terminus, we get very, very little closure, even in the presence of pomalidomide. We no longer have 20%, it's more like two. And this two, these 2% two of particles are not very happy. We don't have robust density for the sensor loop. And it's likely because this N-terminal domain is involved in interactions with the sensor loop. We have a trifecta of interactions. Um, you can see this, you have, obviously have ligand binding the tritryptophan pocket. You have interactions with the sensor loop mediated by that ligand. And then when the, the N-terminus of the lawn domain um, adopts the safety belt conformation, it also adds additional stabilizing interactions to the sensor loop, kind of establishing this trifecta of interactions. And this sets up the chemical surface for interaction with this structural digron, this glycine containing um, beta hairpin. So why do we only have 20% with pomalidomide? It could be that if you extend the interactions with the sensor loop, you could have better drugs. And there was a better drug that came along. Uh, this is CC220. Uh, and uh, Mary solved the crystal structure of this, and in the crystal structure, she was able to see how ibertamide, this is CC220, ibertamide, uh, wraps over the sensor loop. It makes more extensive interactions with the sensor loop. So this could be maybe promoting more closure through additional interactions with the sensor loop. And when we put this uh, ibertamide into the cryo-EM with Cerebron DDB1, we did see an increasing amount of closed conformer that we have. We went from 20% with palmalidomide to now 50% with ibertamide. 
So you've only got about five minutes left um, to wrap this all up. So uh, I'm going to glance over this. This Ibertamide, the crystal structures have very high, high B factors for the ibertamide. And in our cryo -EM, we didn't see robust density for the ibertamide. Uh, and additional structural work from another group that worked on the, it's a bacterial homolog of thalidomide binding domain, uh, also saw that the ibertamide could bind in a variety of different orientations. So this peripheral region of ibertamide is probably not always in that arching conformation that was seen in Mary's crystal structure. It may be a bit more dynamic and flopping around, which is why we don't have more than 50% closure. So there's still a great need for better drugs. Uh, most patients uh, do experience relapse uh, with, with treatment of these cell mods and this requires additional therapy. And there are some patients that are completely refractory to, uh, to pomalidomide and other cell mods. And so there, there is still a great need for better drugs. And it may be that some of these patients that are refractory, that, that don't respond to the, these drugs, carry mutations in cerebellum. I guess it's known that, that meant some of these patients carry uh, mutations in, in cerebellum. And this may be messing with the mechanism of cerebellum closure, which is why they don't respond to these drugs. But there was this drug that, that uh, BMS uh, discovered, CC92480, which was named mazigdamide. I love these names that they come up with. I would love to know where they come from. Uh, it seemed to be very, very effective in an imid resistant cell line. So we wanted to have a look at what this might be doing. We, Randy added it to the cerebral on DDB1 complex. And within an hour of data collection, Randy was jumping up and down and saying, my goodness, we have 100% closure. He's been staring at these 2Ds for so long that he knows immediately uh, how much open and closed conformers uh, one, is it, one has in their, in their data set or he has in his data set. And indeed with the 3D reconstruction, we were able to show that with the, the wild type cerebellum, mesigdamide does promote 100% closure. And we could see the details, the, the atomic, I guess the, the pseudo atomic details uh, explaining why this is occurring. So we have obviously the interaction with the thalidomide binding domain at one end. We have the arching over the sensor loop. As with ibertamide, this region is somewhat flexible, but then importantly, even though we have some flexibility in the middle region, we have very nice stabilizing interactions. We don't have atomic detail, but we can make some predictions that there are probably interactions, uh, aromatic interactions with these phenylalanines on the <clears throat> in the long domain. So this is now functioning as a staple that holds these two domains together, which is what induces 100% closure. So it does seem that by increasing interaction with both the sensor loop and then by the long domain, you can increase degradation efficacy. And now the big question is, is this going to be effective in patients that are carrying mutations in cerebellum? Uh, this is still under confidentiality agreement, so I can't tell you which mutation we tested, but this is one of the known refractory mutants. And we were able to show, or Randy was able to show that when we add mesigdamide, uh, we were able to overcome the, the lack of closure. So on the left, this is uh, pomalidomide plus substrate uh, with this mutant cerebellum. And then when we add mesigdamide, we do have closure. It's only 30%, but 30% is a lot better than zero. So I hope over the course of this lecture, I've, I've been able to show you how cryoEM can be used to add new insights into a system that was thought to be pretty well understood and pretty established. Uh, and we know now that there is this transition from the open state to the closed state that has to happen uh, for for substrate binding to, to cerebellum. Uh, and this rearrangement uh, involves rearrangement of uh, this sensor loop here in magenta, mediated by interactions with the drug that you're putting into the thalidomide binding pocket. And then that triggers uh, or reorganization of an N-terminal safety belt. And that if you can, if you can strengthen the interactions between these two lawn domain, the, the lawn and thalidomide binding domain, uh, you can have a more effective uh, cell mod. This increases efficacy of the drug. Uh, so the, all this work has been posted. It's publicly available on the bioarchive. You can take a screenshot of this QR code 
or of the link and uh, please download it and have a look. Uh, send us any feedback you might have on it. And it's 9.50, I will stop here, 9.50 for me on the, on the West Coast. And really need to thank uh, Randy uh, Watson, who's been a really outstanding postdoc. Uh, couldn't have asked for a better researcher to be taking on this very challenging project. Uh, also need to thank the former colleagues uh, who were, uh, colleagues who were formerly at uh, Bristol Myers Squibb who got this all started, Mary, uh, Phil, uh, Andres went over to, <clears throat> to BMS to help out before they're all now at, at uh, Neomorph. Ingrid Works has taken over uh, and has, we've collaborated with Jin Yi there. And I also have to say that the HDXMS that we did was in collaboration with Scott Novick and Pat Griffin at Scripps Florida. And I will stop there. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.